Hello, everyone. My name is AMX with the Facts. You are now watching the AWF series. And of course, we make the unknown. Known. That's right. And right now, I'm here in the great city of Dubai. And also, everyone, please follow my Instagram page, AMX with the Facts. That's F A C T S, not F A X, on Instagram. And all my interviews will be posted on IGTV from Sunday to Thursday, 5 p.m. But right now, I have a very special guest. He goes by the name of Mr. Andrew Riot. And he is from Egypt. <laughs> and just to let you everybody know, Mr. Andrew, he is a very well-known uh, poet. He's also very big in TikTok as well. He's a very passionate person that likes to change, let's just say change ideas or uplift new ideas to make the future a better place. He's also very passionate of his home country. But you know what? That's a long introduction. I'm going to let this gentleman share everything about himself. Mr. Andrew, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Amax? I'm doing all right. So, Mr. Andrew, may you please tell your fans and your future fans who you are and what you're all about. My name is Andrew Riyad. Um, I'm from Egypt. I grew up everywhere, and I'm all about representation and decolonization. That's it. Okay. Now, when you say about decolonization, what do you mean decolonization? Because most people, when they hear that term, it's more like related to like European empires, like dated back from 15th to the 19th or 21st century. So when you say decolonization, yeah. what, what type of decolonization are you talking about? I mean, I think people like to talk about unjust histories a lot, but we forget about unjust presents, you know, that become unjust histories. I think we live in a time with a lot of unjust presents, a lot of neo-colonial presents, you know, hmm. like behind, but for like, you know, past the global empires, past what we know as like the conventional colonialism, hmm. we do live in a world where, if you look a specific type of way, if you speak a specific kind of way, you are given because of large forces, large constructs, be it patriarchy, be it colonialism, you know, that will cater to you and all your every needs, you know. And I am also, you know, privileged in that sense, you know. I have my own set of privileges because of it. So I think when I talk about decolonization, I don't mean you know, the pretty little theory, you know, that we can discuss in a classroom and read Emma Cezav or Edward Said or whatever. I, while all those are great for theory, you know, I talk about practical hands-on, you know, decolonization, beginning with yourself. We have to you realize that so many of us are products of white supremacist um, ideologies. And in my context, a lot of Arab ideologies also that we should kind of unlearn and in unlearning that come to our true selves you know and be proud of our lineage and of our diversity hmm. so i guess that's kind of what i mean oh okay well actually that's a new term i haven't you haven't heard before but you say um like I, we heard the term neo uh, colonialism but when you mentioned about decolonization of histories you say decolonization of presence so that's like a new that's actually a good title that should be a movie um okay <laughs> So when you mentioned about this, uh, which country are you mostly passionate about? Because you said that Egypt, right before we before we um, this interview started, you said that Egypt is also, in a way, still colonized, not just from European powers indirectly, but also uh, Arab, you know, the Arab world presently. That like you still have the Arabic yeah. culture still dominating Egypt. But you said that you're from this particular area, from the Coptic and Nubian mix uh, descendant. So you, you want to just, uh, explain more about that? Um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call Egypt colonized. I don't think a lot of people would like that, you know, but oh. I do think that Egypt has, Egypt is really resilient. You know, Egypt as a land, as a home has persevered through a lot of invasions, a lot of invasions, you know. Mm. Um, and I think Egypt has had multiple kind of new realizations and, and has been shaped and reshaped quite a few times, but it's given because, you know, Egypt is a very, very, very old country, you know, with its own empire lineage and its own history of, you know, conquest and of, you know, of development. Um, but with my lineage, um, so I'm Coptic Egyptian, which means I'm Coptic Orthodox Egyptian. So I'm Christian Egyptian. Um, but in that Christian, there's also the Coptic. In Arabic, it's Ipti. Um, and my entire family is Coptic. Um, from my immediate family to my second cousins, my fourth, seventh, eighth, where all of us are Coptic, which is beautiful. Um, but at the same time, I think nowadays it's becoming kind of rare. 
Egypt used to be a Coptic country, you know, before it was an Arab Republic with Syria, before it was Egypt nowadays, you know, it was Coptic. Um, a majority of the population was Coptic, you know, and now we're down to 10 to 15 percent, you when know, you say, which is when you say Coptic. Um, you said that Christian Egyptian, like what's what's another term that we can use for Coptic? Is it more like Greek and Roman or is it more like because we know that the Greeks and Romans also ruled ancient yeah. Romans and Greeks ruled Egypt yeah. for a while. And I think I think it was also a British protectorate at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say, I mean. Our, we have our own language, Coptic language, which is very, very similar to Greek. And it did come in around the time where Alexander. the great Alexander, like where great Alexander came to Egypt, you know, and introduced Christianity essentially to Egypt right after the Pharaonic times and the whole paganism moment. You know, that's why some people will tell you now, like, you can't trust Coptic people because they're pagans, you know, because but well, we just came right after paganism. You know, we have no tie to paganism, you know. Um, so it is very similar to Greek, like our alphabet, like I can read Greek because of, because I speak Coptic, oh. but it's, I would say it's that mixed, like we have seven hieroglyphic letters in, in our Coptic language also. And it's the only language in modern day Egypt that is actually like an, a descendant of the Pharaonic language itself, you know, of hieroglyphics, yeah. which I think is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I would say around, you know, Greek, um, empire of Egypt. Yeah. Ah, okay. So basically, I'm just saying, so the Coptic Egyptians are a little bit descendants from either Julius Caesar or, or King Alexander the Great. So I, I noticed that both of them, like, um, Julius Caesar was famous for marrying uh, Queen Pharaoh or Queen Cleopatra. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, am I similar, am I close to her, or is it more related to Al Alexander the Great when he came? Or is it both? Yeah, it's more related to like, Alexander the Great when he came. Mm. Um, but it's also like... A, it was just like a breeding ground, you know, a multicultural melting pot, you know, Egypt at the time was, and Egypt always was, you know, but at the time, especially you had Mediterranean influences, you had Roman influences, you had, you know, Ottoman influences, you know, a lot of it was just a brewing kind of melting pot of cultures. And in that melting pot, Coptic Christianity arose in Egypt and became the first Abrahamic religion in Egypt. And, did, and how did the British uh, change? They usually, like any, like any country that the British Empire influenced, but I looked at the, because uh, I studied the British Empire one time, and they said that Egypt was actually, or Eastern Africa was a part, was a part of the British Empire. Did the British Empire yeah. also influence Egypt in a particular way? Yeah. Or just the Suez? Yeah, Empire? we were, yeah, we were colonized by the British and by the French also. Hmm. And that's why, like, in our educational system, English is one of the languages, you know, oh. but... You know, if you think about the number one, like the mother tongue essentially of Egypt is Arabic, you know, Arabic. but everyone will speak English. Most, like almost everyone will speak English. Oh. Um, or will know a few basic, you know, the basics of the English language. Um, a lot of our educational systems, um, traffic systems came from the British. The roundabout is a British concept mm -hmm. that we also have here in Dubai, you know, that was also because of the British. Mm -hmm. um, so a bunch of things, I guess. Um, and then the French also, you know, with their little colonial fun, you know, gave us also the language. So you have, <laughs> you'll have French schools in Egypt. You have Egyptians that speak French. Mm. Um, a lot of our Arabic derives from French. Our Egyptian dialect in Arabic, like we'll say, for example, canaba for mm. couch. And French is canapé. Mm. You know, douche is to shower. Douche is, shower, you know, the shower head in French. So a lot of our actual Egyptian. But it's so interesting because Egyptian dialect, will take these words and Egyptify them, you know? Oh. So they're not exactly the same. It's not douche, it's douche, you know? Um, so I find that interesting also as a sort of, I think that's like decolonial in its own, you know, you know which is interesting. In America, in America, I'm, I'm laughing because when you say douche, like douche in America means something this means something different. It's more like an insult. Yeah, I know what douche means. <laughs> douche bag, like, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you go to Egypt, there's so many meanings in the states, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so now I also want to ask you now, since you're like you're so, again, like you said, you're so passionate not just about decolonization. I think you're also passionate about the Egyptian culture in itself, and also the origin of the Egyptian culture. I want to ask you some questions uh, about American Hollywood movies about Egypt. We were right back. <laughs> 